Welcome to today's uh, PHO webinar presentation and it's orientation for IPAC leads long-term care. And uh, today's subject is environmental cleaning. My name is Boris Marufov and I am a team lead at IPAC PHO and I will be moderating today's session. And uh, before we begin, I will uh, mention a few housekeeping items. Uh, the chat part has been disabled to limit any distractions during this presentation. Please use uh, the Q&A part uh, on your screen if you have any questions during the session. And a discussion question period will follow the presentation at the end. Uh, presentation slides and recording will be made available in two weeks from now, uh, from today's session. And if you have uh, in any point during the session experiencing any technical issues, please email to capacitybuilding at ohpp.ca. Uh, with this, uh, I will uh, introduce uh, presenters for today's session. And they are uh, Tanya Denich and Sarah Eden. Uh, Tanya Denich has been uh, an infection control pract practitioner since 2007. Tanya holds bachelor's of science uh, degree from the University of Waterloo and master of, master's degree from in microbiology from University of Guelph. Tanya was uh, the IPAC team lead in the emergency department uh, operating room in medical device reprocessing. Tanya has also been the IPAC lead for a variety of programs in the past, including maternal, child, complex care, critical care in, uh, in the hospital. Um, another presenter for today is Sarah Eden. Uh, she received her uh, BSc in nursing uh, from Laurentian University and completed additional courses in epidemiology and infection control. She obtained her um, CIC designation and has been recertified from Certification Board of Infection Control and Epidemiology. She's worked as a research assistant and infection control practitioner in large academic acute care hospital. Sarah joined uh, the regional infection control networks back in 2008 and has since worked as a network coordinator, acting regional uh, infection control network manager, and now as a regional uh, infection prevention control specialist at Public Health Ontario. Uh, with this, uh, now I will ask Sarah to begin today's presentation. Thank you so much, Boisa. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. So we are really excited to be sharing another session in this learning series uh, with you. Okay, so the learning objectives for today's session are to describe the role of the environment in transmission of infectious agents and the importance of collaborating with environmental service departments. So collaboration may be things like environmental service audits, policy and procedure development, or ensuring your environmental service is meeting best practices. Learning objectives will be to identify key principles of cleaning and disinfecting the environment, as well as IPAC considerations related to the physical environment, waste management, laundry, and linen handling. And our agenda, we're going to start with a couple of minutes about an introduction to the checklist and our IPAC orientation for long-term care leads and long-term care, and then move on to the content for today, which is our environmental cleaning, and have a few uh, minutes for questions and answers. Okay, so you may have seen uh, this image before if you've participated in some of our uh, previous sessions, and this is available on our website. So this is the checklist uh, for IPAC orientation for leads in long-term care. So Public Health Ontario has developed a web page that will contain this checklist, as well as the series of presentations, one of which you're participating in today. They will be recorded and posted there. Uh, so hopefully this checklist in this series will be part of of your learning and development for orientation and will help you develop a roadmap for ongoing professional development. So I think before we start, it's really uh, important to think about what are healthcare associated infections and what is the role of the environment? So healthcare associated uh, infections, they occur 
as a result uh, of either getting care interventions or living, working, or visiting a healthcare setting. So there are many factors that contribute to the development of a healthcare associated infection, some of which you might be familiar of, things like the age of the individual, if you have an increasing number of residents in your long-term care facility, uh, complex treatments, uh, maybe also increasing use of antimicrobials in healthcare, which could contribute to the creation of a reservoir of resistant microorganisms. Uh, also, infrastructure repairs, renovation for aging facilities uh, could create a risk for airborne fungal diseases and spores. So there are many factors uh, that can uh, contribute to the development of a healthcare associated infection. And uh, the one that we're really going to focus on today is about the cleanliness of the environment. So a key factor is the cleanliness of the environment around the residents and that environment will influence the incidence of uh, infections in healthcare settings. And sort of what is the evidence or how do we know that the environment is involved in those healthcare associated infections? Uh, a healthcare environment has been shown to be a reservoir for infectious agents. So this may be bacteria like MRSA, VRE, C. diff, it could be viruses like COVID-19, influenza, or it could be fungi like aspergillus. Um, and we know that germs can be spread from the environment to residents. So you will see on uh, the right hand side of your screen there, there is an image. So that's the cover of one of our PIDAC documents. So the Pro uh, Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee document, that's the one for best practices uh, for environmental cleaning for the prevention and control of infections in healthcare settings. And within that document, there is a uh, citations of a lot of evidence that really contributes to how do we know the environment is having an impact and that document will show that uh, germs survive in the environment that they can be uh, spread from the environment to your residents or clients uh, contaminated environment is associated with infections in residents and i think one of the uh, most important reasons we're here today is that effective cleaning disrupts the spread of infection. So that's one of our goals. That's uh, why we are in infection prevention and control and we uh, really do want to accomplish. So then as an IPAC lead, what role do I play and why should I collaborate? So environmental cleaning is uh, key to infection prevention and control. And as an IPAC lead, uh, you may be involved in providing education to environmental service staff. It may be ensuring that the environmental service is participating in the IPAC committee. It could be participating in identified identifying roles and responsibilities for environmental cleaning. So things like uh, being sure that you know who is cleaning Things like shared resident care equipment and devices. Is that being done by uh, the care provider at point of care? Is it being done by environmental service? Really helping uh, navigate some of those roles. You may also be involved in verifying that uh, the organization's policies and procedures are based on best practice uh, guidance. And you may be involved in consultations with your environmental service department for the uh, product selection and emphasizing the need to follow manufacturers instructions for use. So there really is a lot of opportunity for collaboration and the IPAC lead to be working with your environmental service to help accomplish the shared goals of preventing transmission of infectious agents from the environment to those who are uh, living, receiving care, working or visiting your long-term care facility. So that brings us to key principles of cleaning and disinfecting the environment. Uh, many IPAC leads in long-term care may be coming from clinical backgrounds and may not have education or training related to cleaning and disinfecting uh, the healthcare environment. So that's one of the reasons uh, this particular topic is included in our learning series, as well as some additional resources and links that will help you with some of these uh, key principles. 
So we're going to start with some of them. And I mentioned that one area where IPAC leads may be involved in working with environmental service is things like equipment selection and purchasing. So the administration of your healthcare setting is responsible for verifying that any item that is used in the provision of care for residents is capable of being cleaned and disinfected according to the manufacturer's instruction for use. So also environmental uh, cleaning equipment itself must also be able to uh, be cleaned, disinfected and meeting uh, those standards. So uh, I think there's some key considerations here when you are involved in uh, equipment selection and purchasing. You do want to consider occupational uh, health requirements, resident safety, uh, IPAC, and environmental safety issues. So equipment that's purchased uh, must have written instructions for how it should be cleaned and disinfected, and also making sure that any equipment that is coming into your home is able to be cleaned and disinfected according to the manufacturer's instructions for use and according to recommended standards. So this would apply to any items that are loaned or shared. So you want to make sure that you aren't bringing equipment in your home that cannot be uh, properly cleaned and disinfected, and uh, that you do have those written policies. Um, and if you are receiving any sort of donated equipment, so that's loan shared, it could also be donated, uh, that they are able to be cleaned and disinfected appropriately as well. And items that are provided by outside agencies and then returned to that agency for cleaning and disinfection are also subject to the same standards as any equipment that would be cleaned or disinfected in-house. So. This might be things like uh, therapeutic bed surfaces or mattresses that may be cleaned or disinfected outside. And also, uh, they would also need to be following those same standards. So we're thinking about uh, cleaning and disinfecting within your home. We also want to think about finishes and surfaces within a long-term care setting. And it's really important if you are involved in the selection or choice. And if you are not, this is an area where you would like to become involved. So you're able to provide input before items come into your home to ensure that uh, surfaces actually can be uh, cleaned. So when we're thinking about considerations for uh, finishes and surfaces, we're thinking about uh, medical equipment, but also all the other finishes and surfaces in your home. So that would be materials for floors, ceilings, walls, any kind of uh, furnishing. So we want to think about a few different characteristics. The first is cleanability of the items or surface. So you want to have uh, surfaces that can withstand your regular frequent uh, cleaning with uh, detergents, cleansers, uh, disinfectants that are used in healthcare settings. Um, you want to have things that are compatible with the uh, uh, products that you are using and any upholstered furniture in care areas, uh, you want to be covered with fabrics that are fluid resistant, non-porous and can withstand uh, cleaning products. So another thing to think about with your finishes and surfaces is uh, you want to have uh, things that are easy to maintain and uh, repair if needed. So any kind of fabrics that are torn uh, or have damage uh, will allow for the potential for entry of microorganisms and cannot be properly cleaned. So things that are scratched or chipped could allow for accumulation of microorganisms be more difficult to clean and disinfect. So you do want to have uh, some sort of system in place so that uh, items in your facility are inspected regularly to ensure they are in good repair. Uh, the other thing about uh, finishes and surfaces is you want to think about an inability to support uh, microbial growth. So any kind of materials that hold moisture uh, are more likely to support the growth of uh, germs or microorganisms. Uh, so you want things that will not be holding moisture. Uh, hard surfaces such as metals and uh, hard plastics are less likely to uh, support that kind of growth. 
Uh, when thinking about uh, surfaces as well, items that uh, do not have uh, seams or pores are going to be better. I think I mentioned uh, fabrics, so things like uh, uh, cotton and porous fabric is uh, going to be uh, difficult uh, and really shouldn't be used in uh, care areas uh, where you have immunocompromised clients and residents located. You do want surfaces that uh, can be cleaned. And uh, when it comes to inspecting, you also want to have uh, some sort of a policy for staff to report or have those damaged items uh, removed from your care areas. So this could be things like replacing uh, mattresses or pillow covers when they're torn, if you have evidence of uh, liquid that has penetrated or uh, visible stains, you want to have a process so people know how they can report it, how it can be removed, and how it can be replaced. Uh, you will notice in uh, the call out box on this slide, uh, you know, we understand that items may be brought into your long term care home uh, from residents or family members, and they might want to bring in items that uh, might not meet these criteria for finishes and surface. So I think you want to think about managing that according to your home's policies and procedures, uh, as well as on a case by case basis. So depending on uh, the furniture there might be options to cover it with something that can be uh, cleanable, or uh, you might be able to restrict it to use only by that uh, resident, or have a plan or and have a plan to have it cleaned in the event there is some sort of blood or uh, body fluid. We are seeing more electronic equipment within uh, healthcare settings. And I think a uh, general uh, piece of information around this if your equipment cannot be adequately cleaned or disinfected, or if it cannot be covered to allow for appropriate cleaning and disinfection, it should not be brought into the immediate care environment. So you do want to ensure that there's policies and procedures in place for staff appropriately cleaning and disinfecting electronic equipment and uh, devices. So I've mentioned a lot about the role of the environment and the importance of uh, environment in preventing transmission. And now I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, how we're going to accomplish some of the environmental cleaning goals. What are those key principles? Uh, so a little bit to think about will be cleaning and disinfecting. Tanya will go into a bit more detail, but I want to talk a little bit first about the products. So detergents and uh, cleaning agents. So the purpose of detergents or cleaning agents is really to remove soil or any materials that could be organic, such as blood or body fluid. Uh, they need to be approved by your environmental service, infection prevention control, and occupational health. Uh, your uh, detergents and cleaners need to be used according to the manufacturer's recommendations. And if you are using a product that is a cleaner or a disinfectant, uh, you need to be aware that this is part of a two-step uh, process. So first you will have your cleaning. So that is going to be removal of any soil, organic materials and cleaning. And surfaces do need to be cleaned before they are disinfected. So the second step would be uh, disinfection uh, by uh, healthcare grade disinfectant. So now we will go on to disinfectants. So disinfectants, uh, they rapidly kill or inactivate most infectious agents. Um, so if you have a product that is just a disinfectant uh, and it's not uh, cleaner and disinfectant combined, uh, sometimes you will have two-in-one type products that are doing both cleaning and disinfecting. And that's really important to know. But if you have a disinfectant, uh, you need to clean first before it is disinfected. And for your disinfectant products, uh, they also need to be approved by environmental cleaning, IPAC, occupational health. Um, disinfectants should have a DIN number. So they must have a DIN number from Health Canada. So this is the healthcare grade disinfectant. Uh, we do have a link in our PIDAC document if you need to uh, have more information or a uh, link to uh, know more about uh, the DIN number. 
uh, and they also must be used according to manufacturer's instructions for use. Uh, that is a bit of a theme and it is a really important uh, consideration. Uh, so I've talked about cleaners, I've talked about disinfectants, they can be either single step where you're using two products, or you may have a combined product that is both a cleaner and a disinfectant. So we're going to go on and talk a little bit more about uh, selecting or some considerations for choosing a disinfectant product. So you may be involved, and I hope you are involved as an IPAC lead in some of the decisions if you are uh, changing or uh, evaluating your current uh, disinfectant products. So here are some considerations. Uh, you want to make sure the product has that uh, drug identification number, so you are using that healthcare grade uh, disinfectant product. Uh, in the case of alcohol, the product may have a natural product number or NPN. Uh, you want to know the nature of the item that is being disinfected. Um, and you also want to uh, know about the contact time requirements. We'll talk a little bit about that occupational health considerations and environmental considerations. Um, so when we're thinking about uh, those products, you want to think a little bit about um, are there any additional uh, considerations? So that could be for uh, the item is being uh, disinfectant. Uh, additional considerations, if the contact time requirements for that product are very long, would that be feasible within uh, your facility with environmental cleaning schedules? Uh, is that feasible? A lot of the time, uh, shorter contact times are more feasible to ensure that uh, the contact time requirements are being met. Uh, for occupational uh, health considerations, uh, there might be different uh, considerations for occupational health and safety, and uh, disinfectants can be one of the leading allergens uh, that uh, can affect healthcare provider staff. Uh, so you want to select products that have a profile uh, that will be non-toxic and non-irritating. So those occupational health considerations are relevant. And environmental considerations uh, is another factor to consider. So you might want to consider products that are biodegradable and are safe for the environment. Um, so uh, when possible, avoiding disinfectants that uh, may be hazardous either in the manufacturing or when they're discharged into the waste system uh, that are not readily biodegradable. So those are some considerations for choosing the disinfectants. And then that brings us on to the use of disinfectants. Uh, so making sure that the item first is clean. So removal of any dirt, visible soil, any kind of body fluid, if it's present before it's being disinfected, uh, that it is being used according to the manufacturer's instructions for use. So thinking about uh, how it is used, that might be things like the correct dilution, so if you have a disinfectant product that dilution is required, you want to make sure uh, you are using the correct dilution. And that may involve uh, sort of quality assurance uh, testing or monitoring, things like test strips to uh, uh, verify that uh, the solution continues to be active. You also want to think if there are any requirements related to uh, the right temperature, so the temperature uh, that it should be stored or used at so that uh, the disinfectant agent will be active and work as intended. Uh, and you want to think about the right contact time. So how long the disinfectant needs to be wet in contact with the surface that is being disinfected. Uh, that also will guide how much of the product is needed to ensure that uh, it does stay wet for that amount of contact time. And uh, when disinfectants are being used, uh, have uh, policies and procedures that minimize contamination so that a uh, soil cloth is not being submersed back into your disinfectant. So the idea of no double dipping and that your solutions are managed and changed frequently. Uh, disinfectant wipes are frequently used in healthcare settings. So do you have a couple of slides specific for uh, disinfectant uh, wipes here? Um, so disinfectant wipes uh, 
should not be your primary uh, approach for cleaning and disinfecting, uh, but they do have a role, particularly for cleaning and disinfecting uh, equipment that might be used at a uh, point of care. And you want to think about uh, using them properly. Uh, so you can see the image there has an open uh, canister with your disinfecting wipes. So when you are storing them, uh, it would be wonderful if they were available close to the point of care use. So if you have uh, healthcare providers that are using the disinfectant wipes, they are familiar with how they are to be used, that the lids of those containers are closed so that the product does remain wet. If it is uh, allowed to dry out, uh, it will no longer uh, be effective. So this, uh, those dried out wipes should be discarded. Uh, for wipes, you want to have a safety data sheet and be used accordingly. So if there are any uh, considerations for occupational health or how they are used uh, safely, it might be things like wearing gloves uh, when handling. Uh, you want to make sure that the active ingredient is an appropriate healthcare grade disinfectant. Uh, there might be other ingredients that uh, are in the disinfectant wipes to enhance efficacy, but just making sure that uh, they are appropriate uh, healthcare grade disinfectants that's being used. And you want to think about ensuring that uh, if you are cleaning a larger piece of equipment, that uh, it is remaining uh, wet for the necessary contact time. So for some uh, pieces of equipment, that could mean using more than one wipe. Uh, typically, uh, wipes would be used for items that cannot be soaked or uh, submerged. So it could be that they are used for uh, point of care uh, type equipment, maybe something like a stethoscope. So that's sort of thinking about when to use them. I've mentioned often items in the care environment that will not tolerate soaking. So wipes are an additional disinfectant to be used. They wouldn't be your primary disinfectant for all of uh, the areas within your long-term care home, but they might be good for those non-critical uh, pieces of equipment that uh, we'll need uh, to be disinfected. Uh, so a point of care uh, item example there is stethoscope. And if you do have users that are cleaning their equipment, you'd want to make sure that you do have policies, procedures, so people know whose responsibility is to clean that equipment and how to identify if a piece of shared equipment has been cleaned and disinfected. So you are very often unable to tell by simply visual uh, this visually inspecting or looking at the equipment if it has been disinfected or not. So you want to have a way of uh, identifying whether it's where it is stored or policies and procedures about uh, who is doing that disinfection. It could be your healthcare worker immediately following use before it is returning to a designated area. But you want to think about that in terms of your uh, disinfectant uh, wipes. So I know that's been a fair bit of information around uh, sort of the key concepts for product selection uh, and some about those uh, cleaning and disinfecting products. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tanya, who will talk a little bit more about routine cleaning disinfection and take us through the remainder of this portion of the presentation. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. Um, we're just going to move on to the next part of the presentation, just talking a little bit about routine cleaning and disinfection, as well as risk criteria and um, frequency of cleaning for those areas. So routine cleaning practices are necessary to maintain specific measures of cleanliness and must be effective and consistent to reduce the transmission of Organ, microorganisms. And routine cleaning is what we apply every time we do our cleaning. The frequency of cleaning is dependent upon the risk classification, the surface of the item to be cleaned, and such things as um, are the surfaces high or low touch, the vulnerability of the resident or client population, and the level of contamination, as well as the activity in the area. So example of this would be if you look at a telephone in different care areas, if the telephone was in a patient resident room, um, it could be touched by many different people, including those with an, uh, with an infectious illness. However, a telephone in a manager's office would likely only be accessed by one person and may only be cleaned periodically, where the resident room is a high touch surface, so it needs to be cleaned more frequently. So that's an example of uh, where an item is, depending on the care area, the area it's located, 
it would require a different level of cleaning. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, higher low touch surfaces and vulnerability and level of contamination in some um, upcoming slides. So when we look at measures of cleanliness, there's two general measures of cleanliness for, that we use in healthcare. We use um, hotel clean and healthcare clean to stratify the level of cleaning. In hotel co co component, the areas of facilities that are as what the areas of facilities that are not involved in client residence care, such as lobbies and waiting rooms, offices, corridors, elevators, stairwells, and service areas. The measure of uh, cleanliness in these areas are based on a visual appearance that includes dust and dirt removal, waste disposal, and cleaning of windows and surfaces. In the healthcare clean, it concludes all the area, all the components of the hotel clean, plus some additional factors. And this kind of clean is usually done, is always done in the area where client resident care is occurring, such as resident units, resident rooms, including nursing stations, procedure rooms, bathrooms, clinic rooms, diagnostic and treatment rooms. And the aim of the healthcare clean is to eliminate microbial contamination within the environment. And like I said, the whole healthcare clean includes all the components of the hotel hotel clean with a high touch of surfaces cleaning and disinfection, as well as just cleaning and disinfection of non-critical medical equipment, as well as auditing those practices to make sure that compliance is upheld. So the reason they're stratified like this, that we do this, we this is noted in the PIDAC document, is that we want to um, be able to prioritize our healthcare resources, our EVS resources, so that there, uh, if we need to uh, prioritize them, they're prioritized to the healthcare clean areas. So the areas that where patient resident care is occurring. Um, so if we need to target it, they go there first, they're centered there. And um, so we can, uh, you know, prioritize human resources as well as supplies and equipment um, uh, to those areas first. Factors to consider when determining uh, to clean a uh, when to clean, we want to take a few things into consideration. Um, how often, uh, how often does it need to be clean would be dependent on is the surface high or low touch. And if we look at the Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee, it states that high or low touch surfaces such as mirrors or windows and walls require cleaning on a regular basis. And of course, when soilage or spillage occurs, and we always need to clean when soil or spillage occurs. High touch surfaces, however, are surfaces such as doorknobs, railings or light switches, and they should be cleaned at least daily, but more frequently if the risk of contamination is higher. We also need to consider the activity taking place in the particular area that would increase uh, the risk of environmental contamination with blood or, blood or body fluids, so that's a consideration, as well as the vulnerability of the residents in the area. Are they immunocompromised? What's their particular vulnerability to infection? As well, um, are there surfaces that are likely to be exposed to blood or body fluids? And if so, you really want to consider increasing the frequency of cleaning and disinfection. Another consideration is, are the, do the residents have a certain type of infection, such as C. difficile, vancomycin-resistant enterococci, or VRE? In those cases, there will be special recommendations for um, cleaning. For patients and residents with um, C. difficile, the recommendations have to have bathrooms cleaned twice daily with a disinfectant capable of killing spores, so sporocidal. And the rooms of these resident rooms should require twice daily cleaning with a disinfectant or sporocidal side. For those residents with confirmed or suspected VRE, um, homes may want to consider increasing the frequency of the cleaning to twice daily if they're concerned that transmission or outbreak may occur. So those are some considerations to think about when you're thinking about your cleaning frequency. With regards to outbreaks, there may be a requirement for additional or enhanced cleaning of the healthcare setting um, when an outbreak is occurring in order to control the transmission of the, the microorganism causing the outbreak. The outbreak committee uh, should include, among other departments, representation from environmental services who will need to lead the coordination of the department's activities during the outbreak for cleaning. So the policies and procedures that should be reviewed um, should include um, contingencies for increased staffing for environmental services that would allow for surge capacity during the outbreaks as determined by the outbreak community, committee meeting management committee meeting. So examples include, um, you know, bringing in additional staff to do deep cleaning or decontamination cleaning, um, to do above and beyond cleaning of those outbreak areas, as well as you may need new, more supervisory staff and you may need to bring in more equipment and supplies for the affected outbreak areas.
For any residents under additional precautions, signage needs to be post, posted above the door or out, at the entrance to the room that indicates what PPE are required when entering the room and carrying out activities inside. Additional precautions are IPAC interventions that are used in addition to routine practices. So when we see the contact sign, the droplet contact and airborne precaution sign, we know that we, in addition to our routine practices that we do every patient every time, we need to also add these additional precautions to help interrupt the train of transmission of this agent we're trying to control for. And all staff at the facility, regardless of discipline, need to comply with these precautions before entering the room. So that's a very key factor. And when additional precautions require extra cleaning, a process should be in place to ensure that this is communicated to environmental services staff. So different facilities use different modalities to make that communication. But it's very important that they know uh, that EBS knows that they may have to go above and beyond, especially with um, organisms such as C. difficile, uh, carbapase uh, producing enterobacteriaceae, as well as VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococci. There may be some contingencies for additional cleaning um, procedures in those um, instances. Now, there's always something new and evolving in EBS and all technologies. So if this is areas not exempt and new methods for cleaning disinfection are coming out all the time. And you may have heard of some of these exciting technologies as they may be used in some jurisdictions, but perhaps not in others. So some of them, they may be new to you. Uh, if you look at the PIDAC document, it does discuss some of the um, you know, the new and evolving technologies listed in this slide, such as electrotic spray systems, air disinfection and fogging using hydrogen peroxide systems, ozone gas, super oxidized water, UV, steam vapor, or antimicrobial impregnated supplies and equipment. So some of that is discussed in the PIDAC document, but we just recommend that before um, you make a change to newer products, that considerations be given to a couple factors, um, specifically the terms of the how effective it is, the ease of implementation, as well as occupational health and safety concerns, such as toxicity to residents or, or healthcare workers, um, as well as ergonomic considerations and cost implications. Um, it's really important to remember that these uh, new technologies do not replace routine environmental cleaning. They're in addition to environment, the environmental cleaning and disinfection you're already doing. So they're just an added layer um, of cleaning that you add on top. And it's also wise to uh, you know, follow the manufacturer's instructions and to reach out to facilities that are already using this technologies. They may be able to guide you to write additional insight and recommendations on how they've been able to deploy these technologies and, and their pros and cons and successes that they've had with them um, before you make that purchase. And you can also sometimes arrange a trial with the manufacturer to see how it will work in your facility and how you're going to roll it out. Um, it's important for IPAC leads to be involved in the education of EBS staff and that for them to be educated, um, not just at the upon hire, which is definitely required, but also ongoing throughout their career. Um, and this uh, education needs to be provided not just to the um, staff that is employed by the facility, but any contract agencies that may work within your facility as well. So to make sure that uh, consistent um, IPRAC pro practices are implemented. Um, and as well, uh, that training program must include written uh, plans and as well as a written um, training record so you can make sure and verify that all training has occurred. As well, when that um, EVS worker or any worker is being onboarded, it's important that um, auditing practices occur and observations so that the workers um, observed um, doing their job and observed using audit checklist um, for a visual assessment of cleanliness and performance audits, as well as post surface testing. And you can use um, example of that as fluorescent marker ATP testing to make sure that the cleaning was adequate, adequately done. In the training, all aspects of cleaning disinfection should be covered. That includes a chain of transmission, pest control, and outbreak response to make sure that everyone has a compre comprehensive view of IPAC practices expected within the facility. Now switching gears a little bit, we're going to be talking about IPAC considerations for the management, uh, managing the physical environment of environmental services, environmental cleaning, as well as waste management and laundry and linen management. So we're just going to take a few moments to uh, discuss some of these things. 
The physical consideration um, for the physical environment um, with regards to IPAC considerations for environmental cleaning, there should be sufficient housekeeping closets to maintain a clean and sanitary environment. They should, these environmental, um, the physical environment, environmental cleaning rooms should have PPE available, be ventilated and have dedicated hand hygiene sinks and eye wash station. As well, they should be locked for restricted access and never have any personal belongings, food or beverages stored in this. And I know that's a, a point that a lot of places have a difficulty with is uh, enforcing the no food and beverages to be stored in those locations, but it really needs to be adhered to. Consistent with PIDAPAC practices, housekeeping closets are to be negative pressure in relation to the surrounding areas. And this is something to keep in mind when they're designing new facilities or perhaps when redeveloping your existing space to bring it up to current guidelines. Soil utility rooms are another element of the physical environment, and these rooms should be located as close to the point of care as possible, um, so that staff don't have to carry soiled items a great distance throughout the facility. There should be clear separation from clean supply storage areas um, from, for the dirty utility, the soiled utility from the clean should be distinct, and there be, should be no storage of clean items in the soiled utility rooms. There should also have a dedicated hand hygiene sink. So those are a few items to consider with regards to the physical environment. With regards to waste management, ideally you should have an organizational policy already existing and that policy should cover the collection, storage, transport, handling, disposal of waste. These policies should be based uh, on provincial guidelines and local bylaws and the waste should be segregated at the point of generation and into hands-free containers with lids. And in particular, Sharp's waste needed to be disposed of in designated leak and puncture proof um, retain, uh, containers, and they usually have a biohazard symbol. And remember, not to fill them more than three quarters of the way full, that's also very important, and to have them available at the point of care. The staff responsible for handling the waste should be trained and aware of required PPE and know how to don and doff that PPE appropriately. So they should be receiving training to that aspect. They should have established routes for transmitting waste so as to avoid crossing through public areas. We really wanna have the waste disposal, waste disposed of uh, as quickly as possible at the point of use and not have to carry it across the facility. Additionally, as part of your policy related to staff immunization, the waste should be immune to both hepatitis B and tetanus. Well, with regards to laundry and linen, with IPAC, with regards to IPAC considerations to this, again, you should have an organizational policy that covers all aspects of this laundry and linen handling, um, specifically the transport handling collection, washing and drying of soiled linen and laundry. The policy should also cover hand hygiene and personal protective equipment expectations and training of staff with respect to laundry procedures. It's important to remember um, that resident and linen laundry may be contaminated with blood and body fluids and that staff will need, may need to wear PPE, especially if they anticipate any splashes. So they may need to don a gown, a face shield, a mask um, to protect themselves. And this, I find that this is, we find that this is an area that sometimes gets forgotten that, you know, uh, laundry and linen can also be a source of body fluid exposure. And so also to that end, to remember that before placing any item in the laundry bag, that gross, gross soilage should be removed with gloved hands wearing and uh, gowns and face shields when necessary. And all laundry and linen should be handled in a manner that prevents environment contamination. So please refrain from shaking or agitating the laundry when you're stripping the beds. And any wet laundry should be contained in a dry sheet or towel prior to placing in a laundry bag just to contain the soilage. Laundry bags shouldn't be overfilled and they shouldn't be tied tightly. And I'm sure we've all seen, um, you know, the practices that should be discouraged, which are, you know, really tight bags being thrown in the hallway and being overfilled and being too heavy for staff to list, lift. So just some things to consider in your policies to address specifically. Items used for environmental cleaning, such as cloths, mop heads, should be laundered separately from resident linen, and laundry and laundry settings for washing, drying should consider manufacturer's instructions for the material being laundered, as well as as well as the detergent, and uh, also considerations for cycle length of time, temperature, load volume, and water quality are all aspects that need to be addressed to make sure that laundry and linen is properly cleaned. 
With regards to additional precautions, sometimes there's a lot of questions with do residents on additional precautions need any special considerations with regards to linen and laundry? But no, they don't, there are no special recommendations related to the transport handling, washing or drying of linen and laundry. Uh, routine practice are sufficient. You don't need to separate these items and wash them separately from other residents. Um, they can just follow the normal process. Additionally, there are no special recommendations for washing reusable dishware or eating utensils. The usual practices of de decontamination in a com commercial dishwasher with hot water and detergents is considered sufficient. So you can just use your normal process for that as well. So just here are some additional resources that might be good to follow up on to, to just further your learning. Um, we have our environmental cleaning uh, toolkit available on the PHO website, as well as we've mentioned frequently through this presentation, the PIDAC best practice for environmental cleaning. And as well, the, there's a document there for UV disinfection for SARS-CoV-2 and a COVID-19 electrostatic spray disinfection system FAQ sheet that you can refer to. So I believe now we'll be moving on to the question and answer session, um, section with voice. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tanya and Sarah. It was uh, very comprehensive. And uh, we will now move on to uh, Q&A. I thought to address some of your questions. Please continue to enter some if, uh, your questions if you have in the pod. And uh, if you had uh, no chance so far. And uh, let me go with um, what we see there. And uh, I will combine maybe first two questions into one. Um, how do you know if a product is just a disinfectant or if it is combined disinfectant and cleaner? And if it is so, um, so do we need to clean twice, once clean and once disinfect? Sarah, if you can take that. Yeah, so uh, becoming familiar with the products that are used uh, will be important. So the manufacturer's instructions for use will be important for how things are used, but also uh, the product label. Uh, it will identify uh, what type of product it is. Uh, so it will identify if it is both a cleaner and a disinfectant. I hope that's helpful. Uh, this is another area where you may find some additional uh, information uh, within the PIDAC document. There are sections uh, related to uh, product selection and some more details and an area where you would want to collaborate uh, with your environmental service managers as well. Okay, thank you. Um, shower chairs and commodes, are Oxivir wipes acceptable or sh should it be sporocidal spray? Okay, well, maybe I'll continue with this. So you've already heard me say, you want to look at the manufacturer's instructions for use for all equipment. So that will include things like shower chairs and commodes to ensure that uh, the uh, items that are being cleaned and disinfected are compatible with uh, disinfectants, cleaning and disinfectant products you're using. Uh, if you're thinking specifically about things like uh, shower chairs and commodes, uh, those would be larger pieces of equipment. Uh, so you want to think if you do have larger pieces of equipment that are able to be uh, soaked or using your cloth with your uh, disinfectant product or your cleaner and then your disinfectant product, that is preferable to smaller wipes. Smaller wipes are better suited for smaller pieces of equipment uh, because it would be challenging for a larger piece of equipment to remain wet long enough to get the contact time. Uh, and as far as uh, using sprays, it's preferable to use a solution and a cloth uh, to uh, spraying disinfectants, usually for occupational health and uh, safety reasons around uh, uh, some of the inhalation risks. Uh, so it's uh, preferable if you can be using a cloth and a solution to any uh, spraying of disinfectants. Uh, but I think, again, this is one where you want to make sure you're using something that is compatible with what's being cleaned and thinking about uh, that contact time. So do you have the right product? Is it being uh, a separate cleaner or disinfectant? Is your commode chair being uh, wet long enough to achieve the desired disinfection? So if it has a two-minute contact time, a quick wipe with the, uh, you know, uh, 
already uh, prepared disinfectant wipe on a large piece of equipment is very unlikely to keep that uh, commode chair wet for that two minutes. Uh, so thinking about sort of the principles we've talked about, along with the manufacturer's instructions for use for the item being cleaned, as well as the cleaning product. So I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Also one thing to add that we cannot endorse any brand um, of any products. So we go with um, yeah, general messages like this. So um, what are the recommendations for uh, products for cleaning equipment prior to disinfection? It will be uh, very similar that you want to look at the manufacturer's instructions for use. You can get some guidance about uh, general cleaners within our PIDAC document, but you do want a cleaner or detergent that will be removing uh, any sort of visible soil, organic matter, body fluids. If you are using a separate cleaner, and disinfector. You may be using a two-step uh, sort of combined product that does both. So really understanding uh, what you are using. Um, and I wasn't sure if that product was about the first cleaning step. We've mentioned an item needs to be cleaned before it can be uh, disinfected. So the disinfectant that's killing uh, or inactivating your microorganisms can't get under any body fluids or soil. So you need to have something cleaned first. And if you're thinking about cleaning, you also want to think about uh, how you are managing your cleaning supplies. So if it is things like cloths and mop pads and really thinking about uh, how are you managing those cleaning supplies as well. And that's where I was confused by the question. So I hope that does help as yeah, well as so the additional resources. Thank you for remaining. Um, let's take one more question. And, and Tanya, if you can address that, um, I, I will need uh, a person asking about uh, audits, basically the monitoring of environmental cleaning, if you can speak on that a bit. Yeah, so thanks for that question, Boyce. There's several types of audits that can be employed. So your observational audits using checklists. So um, you can use the PIDAC best practice documents has some examples to set up those checklists that you can develop on your own using that as a resource. As well, you can do, um, you know, uh, surveys, um, performance audits, just watching the, um, you know, employee as they work to make sure they're hitting all the key points that they need to do during their job. And as we mentioned in the presentation, there's also post surface testing so you can employ some different strategies there such as ATP or fluorescent marking and in some cases environmental culture as well to make sure that 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 auditing uh, that sorry that the EVS uh, worker is doing their job effectively and reaching all those areas that need to be cleaned and disinfected in the, in the way that Sarah mentioned. So those are a couple different auditing modalities. And, and again, the PIDAC best practice document does go through that. And there is some additional resources uh, for any IPAC Canada members as well that you could re, uh, reference as well for auditing. Okay, sounds good. We are uh, we have still some more questions, but uh, we will uh, try to respond them individually. Uh, if your name is there, unfortunately, with some anonymous attendees, we will not be able to respond because we don't know who to respond um, after the session. And please, uh, you know, uh, vote and then do some some pollings now in front of you. And after the session, uh, please complete the uh, evaluation. Uh, thank you very much, Tanya and, and Sarah in uh, uh, the upcoming uh, uh, sessions, uh, session four to six, uh, we will announce and then send emails uh, soon. Uh, thank you very much everyone for attending.